to hear our featured speaker for this evening. And this would be Mr. Chad Moore. Hey. Who had a long history of making fundamental contributions in the field of dark sky preservations. Chad, educational background, has degrees in geography and earth science, but he's had a, also a long time interest in the beauty and the science of the night sky. He worked for many, many years with the National Park Service and the Park Service. He co-founded the Night Skies team in 1999 and led that team through 2015. And under Chad's leadership, they developed a very sophisticated system for actually making quantitative measurements of light pollution, which provides the robust data that we need when we go into the political arena in trying to make an argument of why we really do need to develop policies and codes that will help preserve the night sky. While at the Park Service, they developed retrofit programs for several parks and also developed policies that enable the park managers to go out into the local community, which is of course the source of much light pollution that the park service itself cannot do anything directly about, but enable them to go out and make an effective case of how it's in everyone's interest to control light pollution. Chad has been active in the International Dark Sky Association for, for many, many years and is currently the chair of the IDA Technical Committee. And he tells me that for, for his daytime job now, he's moved on from the Park Service and works for the Bureau of Reclamation, where he works for the San Joaquin River Restoration Program and now lives with wife and dog in Missoula, Montana. So tonight, he's going to give us a talk on the history of the National Park Service Night Sky Program. Chad? Thank you, Don. Um, yeah, and, and Don was was actually there at, at the beginning of the Night Sky team as well. So I think we're going to be dating a lot of people here tonight, including Chris. Um, so I really appreciate the invitation. Um, although I'm no longer with the National Park Service, it's an honor to uh, talk about the history of it and uh, share that with you. And uh, even though I haven't been with that agency for the past uh, few years. I'll try to fill in the blanks uh, to, to keep the history um, current. So let me get my screen shared here. So, you know, my story here tonight um, starts in 1999 when I was a park ranger at Pinnacles National Monument in California. Uh, Pinnacles, despite being in California, is actually sort of in this dark little area between San Francisco and LA. And I always enjoyed the night skies there. I was an amateur astronomer from my younger days. And one evening while uh, hiking back late from a patrol, I think there was some lost hiker or something. I noticed this light dome off to the West and it was the light of the Soledad prison, their new brand new prison lights. And uh, it was affecting the night sky, you know, well up towards the Zenith. And so, you know, from that experience, I, I went back and I went to the old listserv um, and posted a question. I'm like, well, who in the National Park Service is doing something about light pollution? You know, there, there must be a way to measure it and document it. Um, and I got a bunch of responses back that I don't know either, but I, if you find something out, please let me know. So after hearing this literally a, a dozen times, I said, well, you know, I have this amateur astronomy background. I have a science background, you know, how hard can it be? Why don't, why don't I just uh, start something? So I wrote a modest grant proposal asking for $22,000, you know, to, to launch a, a team of specialists who would look at this issue. We were going to build a camera, a CCD camera to measure the light pollution. We were going to begin inventorying night skies around other national parks. And with this, this sort of a strike team model. And um, it was funded. 
Um, and, and in the funding argument, we made the case that, look, we really need to measure this. And we, if we can't measure it, we really can't get started on this, this conservation process. And that we, it's a, it's a five-step process. You first need to recognize the night sky as a resource that belongs in a park. You need to measure the resource condition. You need to share that resource with the public, get them engaged. You need to lead by example through outdoor lighting. And then you need to like weave it all together into some partnerships. And so, you know, this was the moment of inspiration. And in October of, of 1999, we got word that indeed, you know, we were funded and we were off to the races. So I knew it needed to be a team and I needed to find teammates. Um, so I put out the word, hey, looking for some people. I also found this in our management policies. And I was, we were really fortunate that, that we had visionary leaders in the National Park Service before I came along. People like Denny Galvin, who said, hey, you know, the park, the dark skies and all that darkness protects, including wildlife, has a place in parks and it's something that we should protect. There were times when the park was just the land surface. The sky didn't matter. You know, we didn't care about the airplanes or anything that was going on above. We just, we were into the surface. And that gradually changed. And because of this policy, it really sort of left a, the door open a crack a bit. We, we had the policy support to sort of creatively grow the night sky team within the agency. <clears throat> and so act one of our story is one of inspiration. Um, where from this grant proposal, we moved into, uh, uh, we reached out to the IDA uh, and Don Davis actually organized the, this workshop on measurement. So we got several mines together in Tucson, flew out to Tucson and, and, and compared all kinds of ways to measure the night sky from simplest to the most sophisticated and what were some of the advantages of this. And that's actually where I met Dan DeRisco who agreed to join the team and join this effort and uh, was, was the, the first team member, member and essentially I call him a co-founder. So we purchased this camera and it took us uh, well over a year to get our first successful images with it. Uh, we had um, uh, a defect in our astronomical CCD camera and it took us a while to recognize it. And by the time we got it back from the factory, you know, we were sort of behind schedule. But we did collect our first successful data later in 2001. Um, we were also, uh, in the meantime, started publishing some of our work. Uh, Dan DeRisco wrote an amazing essay on the wilderness ethic and how it's related to night skies. Uh, I really encourage you to, to read his 2001 article. And we started meeting other people and we, with help from astronomers, um, we were able to sort of work our way and learn photometry. Um, so we approached, we knew we needed all sky photometry. We knew we needed to take a picture of the entire sky to measure the entire sky. We knew we wanted not just one measure or a dozen measures, we wanted millions of measures. So with this CCD camera, we basically built a mosaic of the night sky and that's what this lower left image is showing. Our first uh, try was 114 images across the entire celestial hemisphere. And then of course we related that to stellar brightness. We took photometry measurements, of individual stars, came up with a regression and then the instrument constant. So we can convert socially the photons, the, the, the electron readings into, um, into a photometric value. And so, you know, this was some of our first images. You can see, uh, it's not quite a smooth image. You can see some of that mosaic in, in there, but you know, a high definition, a high bit depth, um, a monochromatic image of sky brightness. And this was, you know, the, the foundation of our work to come. No one had ever really done all sky photometry before. We had a few astronomers who said it actually isn't possible that we would have so many stars contaminating our pixels because our pixels were so large compared to what they were doing um, that it wasn't going to work. Um, but we had other astronomers, um, Wes Lockwood um, at uh, Lowell Observatory, Chris Lugaville at U.S. Naval Observatory, who really encouraged us to keep to keep going and keep trying. And we were using sort of parts that you wouldn't normally associate with photometry, like a 50 millimeter Nikon lens to do a lot of this stuff. But ultimately we were able to sort of have isophotes of the night sky. We were able to recognize artificial light sources as well as natural light sources in the night sky and to be able to sort of rate the quality of it. 
much of this work was accomplished by Dan Derisco, um, um, and a scientist who could put his head down and work on a problem for 10 hours at a time and work through some of these thorny issues. Um, I tended to take more of the hardware side, optical train side. Dan did a lot of the photometry, the math, um, and the scripting. Um, and um, really the, the majority of the work um, to get this done. So it's really just a, 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 an amazing partnership. He and I are very much yin and yang, um, sort of opposite but complementary personalities with the different approaches and different skill sets. Um, a lot of the early success can be, can be traced to that. So if that's act one of inspiration, act two is really about perspiration and a bit more inspiration as well. Um, we were able to get a second grant to sustain the team off some of our nascent successes and um, had a very, um, and, and, and took this, took our camera on the road, these, you know, 10 day long, 12 day long field sessions that were incredibly intense, low sleep, um, very formative affairs. Um, I'll show you some of these other um, sort of, I won't go into these dates in detail, um, but other than to say, you know, just because we got our first images doesn't mean there was a lot of work because of QAQC to data. We did some side-by-side -side comparisons with West Lockwood at Lowell um, next to, I think it was a 16 inch telescope um, to verify our work, um, uh, started to engage uh, some of our, our uh, European counterparts at that point. And um, ultimately ended up not only documenting methods, methods, but publishing it in 2007. And so this is an incredible amount of work um, to get there um, to this point. And I mentioned that our first field campaign to the Colorado Plateau, it, it, it was incredibly formative for us. Um, this is a, a, a map that we use to sort of plot out uh, where we were going to take sample. You can see the park, National Park Service outlines in green. And boy, some of this, you know, delicious darkness out there that we really wanted to go out and sample and see if we can find a truly dark sky. Um, of course, the air is incredibly clear. So under these photometric conditions, you know, you can see light pollution from a long, long way away. Um, so we also sort of had a, a strong understanding from this trip of just how fragile the night is. Um, you know, you can, you can see Phoenix from Bryce Canyon, for example. Anyway, so on this trip, you know, we, I, th I think there was a lot of conversations there in the dark as we were, as we were collecting data about, you know, how do we preserve uh, this sort of accident of geography, this incredible dark skies in places like the Colorado Plateau, and how do we, you know, take this and scale it up. About this time, too, uh, we had our sort of Mark II camera system. So, um, a larger CCD chip, uh, high resolution, wider field of view. And instead of an hour to collect one data set, we can collect it in 20 minutes. Um, so we could, you know, sort of shoot gaps between clouds. And uh, this camera system uh, combined with a select star next star that we would sort of strip the telescope off of, change some of the electronics, um, patch into a, a laptop computer, and then choreograph the entire thing. Um, scripted uh, with Visual Basic Script on a, on a Windows laptop. Um, you know, it, it only cost $10,000, which, you know, was impressive, uh, an amount of money, particularly for the Park Service, but um, far less than what a, a professional uh, photometry system would cost. You could, maybe you can catch in this, we're shooting everything through a, a Bessel V filter, a green filter to simulate how the, how the human eye uh, senses the, the sky at night. Uh, I know. And so, you know, the results were, I think we're getting a little echo. The results were everything we hoped for, um, particularly with the, the higher resolution camera. We just got these stunning images. It wasn't just data of the night sky, but you could recognize the terrain. So here we are in like Sunset Crater and, um, you, know, you can see sunset crater in these images. So it, it sort of marries the landscape with the night sky. It's instantly sort of relatable and recognizable. You can show this to a member of the public and with a few simple words, you can explain you know, what you're looking at here. And so this is just the kind of data um, that, that we wanted to get. Dan continued to make you know, advancements in image processing and scripting. And 
was very creative in taking the scientific instrument and turning it into an artistic one in the sense that, you know, he put these panoramas together and duplicated how the eye sees at night, the scotopic vision to show like what the night is under a fully dark adapted condition. And so, you know, these, these pictures came really became our best communication tools. They were iconic and they did a lot to, um, to advance what we were doing. So we knew we couldn't travel around to all these places uh, by ourselves. Um, we added a satellite team um, for a, a period of time. We picked up uh, interpreter and uh, cultural astronomer Angie Richmond from Chaco Culture National Historical Park, New Mexico. Of course, a place rich with archaeoastronomy. And then she was on a smaller circuit uh, collecting data in New Mexico and Colorado and Arizona. Sorry, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. Um, working for the team for a period of time. And she played a role in, in the direction of the team um, from then on. And this got to be such a big job. You know, we were still physical scientists. Um, Dan was doing um, blister rust on white pines. He was doing uh, uh, tree ecology. I was doing a lot of river restoration and, and some other miscellaneous uh, uh, geology stuff at the time. But we had to we had to resign our jobs. The, the, the night sky team became uh, not just a weekend endeavor, a one week endeavor, but uh, a full time endeavor. So in 2004, we resigned our permanent jobs, uh, switching over to uh, essentially a grant funding and became temporary employees again, um, which is <laughs> odd um, to make this work. You know, a couple more milestones along the way. And, you know, in 2002, um, we engaged with um, uh, Travis Longcore and Catherine Rich and others on the biological side to understand the influence of light and darkness on wildlife. And uh, that really resonated with a lot of people who might have sort of belittled just sort of the aesthetic aspects, aspects of the night sky. We were fortunate also in 2002 to uh, have a live radio interview uh, with Neil Conan on Talk of the Nation. Um, and then from that, really a slew of high profile articles in the New York Times and the LA Times and uh, Science News um, at an ever increasing pace. And I think by the time I left uh, the Night Sky team, we had 110 media articles, uh, most of them national media articles on our work. Uh, including some documentaries. Other influences on our work, um, not just astronomers, um, but artists. Um, uh, people like Wally Paholka, who we like ran into uh, at a park one night, um, you know, him taking his pictures. I think he was uh, time picture of the year at some point. Um, you know, but it's sort of talking about the artistic aspect really sort of broadened our view. And from these conversations with Wally, I sort of came up with this postcard hypothesis, which says um, people value what's value of place based on the postcards that are hanging on the rack. And when you can get postcards that have night skies on them, um, that says something. It says the people there value it. And then to the for the locals and then for the visitors who come, it shows people what this place is about, what's special about it. And it has this positive feedback loop. And so if you can get a postcard of night skies or whatever you're trying to project in the gift shop, you've arrived. And so um, that was really a sort of on our consciousness that in order to you know, get a lot of the conservation we really wanted to achieve, we had to sort of go through the processes to, to work into people's sort of cognitive model of what their community is, what's special about their neck of the woods. And so on act three here, we're looking for a hero. And just as a lot of conservation is hinged around like charismatic wildlife, like think of Save the Whales in the 70s. We wanted a charismatic landscape. We wanted a charismatic landscape at night. Around this, we wanted to rally for its conservation. We didn't want to save dark skies for some sort of big aspect. We wanted a battleground. We wanted a line in the sand. This 
is where we were going to save. This is what we were going to save. And so again, this, this imagery uh, that, that, that Dan was able to produce and that other artists were starting to produce with better and better cameras were, were so important in what we were trying to accomplish. So associated with that, that resignation of our jobs becoming temporary employees, we moved the team headquarters to Bryce Canyon. Uh, I moved there um, for a variety of reasons. Dan stayed in California um, for much of the time, but uh, of course we, we met up on these long, long trips. Um, and we were able to get you know, additional grants. This time we got a much larger grant uh, based on entrance fees. You know, you pay your $20 and you go to a park. Um, that goes into a pot of money. Uh, we were able to pull a grant from that. Um, and then Bryce Canyon was really a great incubator for some of our ideas. We can get dark skies at our back doorstep. There was already this interpretive um, um, history there at Bryce Canyon. They had been doing annual star parties since like 1969. Um, and so we held the first astronomy festival, the Night Sky team in concert with staff at um, Bryce Canyon. We also started a, a course there for interpreters. Uh, it was called Sky Rangers. At times it was called Star 101. We had different names for it, but it was the same thing. Um, we, this is, this is the, the act where we developed the, the, the Dark Sky Park certification and the Dark Sky Reserve certification uh, working with, with Parks Canada. So we picked up uh, two more employees, Teresa Giles on the education outreach side and Kate McGargle, a field technician. And of course, this is a team of four, but we also have all the staff at Bryce Canyon, uh, who I've, I've, I've named here. Um, several temporary detailees came into the program for like a week or a month. Um, we had many volunteers, including, um, including Dan's wife, uh, who helped us um, on various projects. And then we were starting to get recognition from sort of the national office of the National Park Service. They have a technical center, not in Washington, DC, but in Denver and Fort Collins. And so uh, people like Chris Shaver, who was head of the Air Resources Branch and uh, Dr. Bill Malm, um, who um, worked in air quality, um, saw a lot of the similarities um, from between our work, our collective work, and we're, we're big supporters of what we do. First Dark Sky Park, Natural Bridges. How that came about, the idea actually was from uh, the chief ranger at Natural Bridges, Ralph Jones. He approached Chris Loganbill. Chris Loganbill contacted Andy Richmond and myself. And then we met and we talked about like, what would it look like to have a certification for Dark Sky? What, what does that mean? What does it mean to be exemplary, right? We didn't want to just hand out awards based on the fact that they happen to have dark skies, which basically means they're remote. So um, building on, on Chris Loganbill's work with the dark sky community, of course, Flagstaff being the first one, we extended that to a park. Um, we wanted that dark sky park to demonstrate leadership. So is at this point, we were becoming quite interested in what kind of lighting is gonna be best for night skies. So we developed this, we wrote it all down. We started doing what we said we were gonna do at Natural Bridges. And then in 2007, the IDEA simultaneously approved the certification program and um, Natural Bridges as the first dark sky park um, at the same time. I think there's 120, 100, something like that dark sky parks to date um, and many more different categories. I mentioned Bryce Canyon had this, this, this long history. And, and so we, I really wanted to take the concept of a star party and turn it on in its head. Um, star parties, in my experience, were about amateur astronomers sort of practicing the craft. Um, not that that's wrong, but I wanted to put a different spin on it. I wanted to take the army that is amateur astronomers and focus them on service and change it to be about not looking for the telescope yourself at faint fuzzies, but really sharing the night sharing this portal of darkness, this harbor of darkness that national parks have. And so rebranded this as an astronomy festival or a night sky festival. And this concept caught on like wildfire. And I quickly found myself sort of traveling to parks around the country to help them set up 
these events <clears throat> and uh, sort of better define what this is. And we did a lot to, um, to sort of professionalize this both in the amateur ranks, uh, amateur strummer ranks, as well as in the ranger ranks. And if you think about it, you know, if you had a, a museum, if you had a science museum that had 300, 000, 300 million visitors a year um, and all of this great experiential learning stuff, it would pull in, you know, whatever millions of dollars you can think of. Like that would be the biggest museum in the world by far. But the National Park Service is that. It already is that, but it's decentralized. So centralizing and finding commonalities between these parks, thematic commonalities, is really a way to sort of make parks work more like museums uh, and science centers. Um, and this sort of this this astronomy festival idea was was an embodiment of that. Um, essentially, we showed the public that this is the other half of parks that they've been missing, and it became very popular. Um, in many cases, the record attendance at parks has to do with these astronomy festivals. There's, there's sort of never more people in a park than there is when there's an astronomy festival there. Some of you have uh, seen or know of uh, doc, uh, Dr. Tyler Nordgren. Um, maybe you've seen his textbook on astronomy. Um, maybe you've seen his posters. These stemmed from a sabbatical in parks that the Night Sky team sponsored. Like he traveled to uh, 12 or 13 parks over the course of the year and made these beautiful posters, um, which were used judiciously. Um, and you know, to pair it, we to pair this sort of work, we also said, well, think let's think about this concept of of astro tourism. Like, you know, how do we quantify that? And so we actually were in the position of sort of giving grants at this point, um, not just taking them, uh, to look at economic research um, on what kind, you know, how much money do these events bring into the community? What is the value of a dark sky um, um, to a place? And coming up with, of course, some, some very significant numbers as, as many of you have seen. Uh, the team, uh, in conjunction with uh, Black Canyon National Park, produced the first thematic junior ranger book. You've probably seen a junior ranger book or kids or grandkids have, have gone to parks and, and done the activities in this. We created one just for night skies. And it was very popular. We printed hundreds of thousands of these um, and uh, really sort of changed the way I think a lot of rangers looked at, at how to educate people within their park thinking about parks, not just as a unique circumstance, which they are, but also the commonalities between them. And at this time, we also recognized that we were really outgunned, we needed more people. And so we recruited volunteers, we trained them, um, we gave them uniform shirts, we gave them special patches. They were our, our core of, of master astronomers. And so, these people did everything from hand out junior ranger books to give telescope and constellation tours. And, and um, we would often um, catalyze the protection of night skies at a park by sending them to volunteers, by sending them a telescope from our Lono library, from sending, from, from helping them set up um, stargazing programs or, or astronomy festivals. And then from that, that sort of Johnny Appleseed approach would come conservation, the park engaging in uh, the local community and so forth. So act four. Act four is when we sort of go from being an outside rogue team to just being part of the, the agency in their national office. We actually relocated from Bryce Canyon to Fort Collins. Um, we got permanent funding in that move. Um, which allowed us to do a lot more things and not chase grants quite as much. We were able to focus a lot more on lighting retrofits uh, in parks. Um, and as parks became sort of aware of light pollution, they all of a sudden wanted to fix it. At this point, there were dozens of parks wanting to be dark sky parks, but they needed to fix their lighting. How do they do this? Um, so we started that process as well. And about this time as on the scientific front, we recognized that in these really, really dark places, um, we were going to, to, to find out how much light pollution we had 
in an otherwise remote area. We are going to need to separate out the Milky Way, the zodiacal light, natural light sources, the light from the stars, from the artificial light. And so um, Dan um, was able to, to synthesize a natural sky um, and model it to a great degree of precision. And so we can actually take our actual sky brightness images, subtract the Milky Way for that particular latitude, longitude, date, and time, and then produce an image of just the artificial light, which really opened up um, a lot of, of neat work. And I think, you know, was, was a big part of improving the, uh, the world atlas of light pollution. You know, and, and over these years, like we continued to do our Sky Ranger training. Uh, in 2011, we held our, our 10th and last Sky Ranger training. At that point, we had um, trained um, well over 200 National Park Service Rangers, also some state park rangers um, and some other cooperatives. And so those people, um, you know, were the people who are now at parks um, getting their superintendent excited about becoming a dark sky park or fixing the lighting. We also picked up uh, uh, two additional um, technicians. Uh, at first, they were highly focused on uh, data collection. Uh, Bob Meadows and Jeremy White, uh, they were sort of uh, glued to Dan Dorisco, learning everything they could um, from him. And then uh, Teresa and Kate uh, with the program also, at that point, uh, moved from Bryce Canyon to Fort Collins, Colorado. You know, these, these Sky Ranger trains, I, I've talked a, a lot about it, but, um, um, you know, they, the interpreters really want to help. They just were unfamiliar with the tools, telescopes, how to give a constellation tour, for example. Uh, they needed to understand sort of the background on light pollution, what they can do about it. Um, they needed a community of support. And so this really got, got that for them. Uh, we drew on our volunteers to help teach the course. Uh, we taught it ourselves. Um, and many of the instructors who came to the course went on to do great things. I think Kelly Carroll in this picture uh, was the person most responsible for building the Great Basin Observatory um, uh, at uh, Great Basin National Park. Um, and so a lot of people came through this program and, and really went on to do, to do great, great things. You know, we, we took our camera and in many cases, instead of pointing it up at the sky, we pointed it down at the lights in the case of this image of, of Yosemite. And we were able to show, you know, just how bad some of the park lighting was and what can be done about it. And a great example of what can be done about it uh, was at Big Bend National Park. Uh, this is a post retrofit picture at the bottom. Uh, LEDs were new at this time. These are, I think, one watt LEDs. Um, Light levels were much, much lower than they were, of course, fairly well controlled um, and just some sort of low illuminations. And then here is the, the photometric picture uh, above is before the lighting grid retrofit below is after, I'm sorry. Yeah, after the lighting retrofit. And, you know, the lights beforehand were like shining on the walls and affecting bat behavior and bird roosting and affecting the night sky and who knows what else. Um, but down below, we were able to really just contain that light to just the developed footprint. And that was a really um, key piece of evidence to show just what can be improved um, with outdoor lighting retrofits. And then Act 5. Um, this is all about sort of new connections and, and uh, covers the period sort of the final um, sort of chapter here. Um, and of course, some of these dates overlap, but you see in 2010, we went from being the Night Skies team to part of the Natural Sounds and Night Skies division. Um, so we still sort of operated in many ways, the, you know, the same as we always had, but we had um, colleagues on who, who were professionals in, in soundscapes. Uh, alongside us in the office. And there was a lot of sort of cross-pollination as you can imagine from that. Um, in 2011, um, I'll talk about the, a little bit more about the Dark Sky Cooperative in a second, but we did a lot more with lighting um, in this national office setting and did a lot more, uh, more and more of our, our technical support work for parks was moving from sort of inventory monitoring towards lighting. 
Um, we had partnerships with Musco Lighting, they're a sports lighting manufacturer, and also the Illuminating Engineer Society. Um, we needed their help, but it was also sort of a backdoor education effort. Um, we knew if we went and asked them for help, we could sort of change their minds on several things, which we did. Um, um, in 2015, um, I left the team. Uh, I, of course, I stay active in night skies, um, but for a variety of reasons, um, I moved to different jobs and to live closer to family. Um, Dan, the next year in 2016, uh, he retired uh, from the National Park Service, but not before he worked on um, the New World Atlas with uh, Chinzano and Falky and, um, and Eldridge, um, and, uh, which is really a, a great publication. We had numerous publications along the way. Um, Jeremy White spent some time with Colorado State University uh, working on, on lighting issues, actually. And after that stint, he returned to the team in 2019. And by last count in 2022, we had over 137 national parks uh, inventory, their sky quality, and 39 other sites. Some of these other sites are state parks, but uh, you know many of them were, were uh, cherished um, star party locations, uh, places in other countries that uh, we were invited to, to uh, Sierra Tololo, uh, places like that. Um, so we did, did quite a bit of work and, and some freelancing on the side, if you know what I mean. I think one of the, I think biggest ideas we came up with was was a building upon sort of dark sky community, dark sky park, dark sky reserve into something bigger, what we call the dark sky cooperative. So in 2011, um, the, the Night Skies and Natural Sounds Division, Supervisor Karen Trevino and myself put together this concept of um, a dark sky cooperative on a landscape level. It's really just a, land, a voluntary landscape level conservation. Um, and we use this tool at first in the Colorado Plateau, which of course is very conservative in nearly all places, maybe Flagstaff is one of the exceptions, um, but uh, with increasing success. And so here's kind of like, you know, this, this lineage of like the dark sky team formation all the way leading towards the, the first established dark sky cooperative on the Colorado Plateau in 2012. There was an, an, another one that has formed at the Basin and Range uh, Dark Sky Cooperative. And there are sort of super secret maps, not really secret, of where would be outstanding to set up Dark Sky Cooperatives throughout North America and other parts of the world. Um, that we've outlined places that are dark, places that are a charismatic and identifiable units um, with which to set up these kinds of conservations that. Uh, can be effective in working class conservative areas, um, which is often what you find in rural areas. And then here's just a map um, showing all of the data collection uh, locations to date. Um, this isn't just one night of data. Many of these locations, many of them multiple nights of data. There's there's 600, currently 617 nights of data. Uh, across 370 distinct locations. So um, sometimes these red dots have two or three or four locations underneath that red dot. So, you know, there was a, this was a team approach. Uh, I was the leader, but there was a lot of help along the way that we wouldn't have made it without. Uh, but I can't make this like an Oscar speech and stand up here and talk about, thank everybody all the time. But uh, other than to say, there was a lot of work that went into this. Um, it was fueled by optimism over a over a sixteen year period and some very long hours. You know, I'd like to think we were sort of walking in the in the path of Galileo. This idea of of observation being the cornerstone of science and recognize that any effective resource management is going to be dependent on having hard data of what is affected the number of the reduction in the number of stars and what is the impact of particular animals. And all of this stuff is like, all those doors are open by having the photometric data. So, but there's also something else. Um, the, you know, the firsthand experience of someone, the firsthand experience of the night that someone has is really essential. You can show someone these images and they're super useful, but 
there's nothing that sort of beats being out there yourself, seeing the beauty of the night sky and also understanding the fragility of it that elicits a caring or a love for a place. And to me, that's necessary for, for conservation to be effective. And so in this process with like the perspectives of cultural astronomy, the perspective of artists, the perspective of people in, who were interpreters uh, talking to the public, I certainly gain an appreciation for everything that Galileo can't do by himself, if you will. Um, all that you rely on for the public to help you with those partnerships. Um, and so that's that's what I take away from it. I, I certainly in my in my professional career now, I, I'm uh, very much about that kind of cooperation. Anyway, I think that is my talk tonight. This website, is um has is it has a portal to it to uh, nearly all of the photometric data that the night sky team collected um you could look that up and go into their viewer and pull down the data sets um and you could you could spend a long time there and there's some interesting surprises places that are darker than you think they would be like sunset crater outside of flagstaff and places that are a lot brighter than you think they'd be like teddy roosevelt National Park in, Mex in um, North Dakota, next to all the, the Bakken oil field. So it's an interesting exploration. Anyway, with that, I will be happy to take some questions. I have a question, Chad. Let me um, stop who, my screen share. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I was wondering who is in the Colorado Plateau uh, of, and if that still exists. Oh, yes, it still exists. Uh, Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative, I think they have a, a they used to have a full-time uh, staff person running it. I think it's a half-time person now. Um, Aubrey Larson, A-U-B-R-E-Y Larson. Um, she's the contact I have there. There's also, you can just do a search for it. They've got a a great website. It's got a the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. It's got a um, really outstanding like dark sky toolbox, a conservation toolbox that is built off of a lot of IDA stuff, but is organized I think much better. Um, so there's some great resources there, and then there's also the Great Basin. Um, I'm actually I, forgive me. It's the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. Uh, Are these the one that's out in Nevada? Are these um, parks? national parks that are in the cooperative or is it other groups as well it's the whole landscape it's oh, voluntary okay. so it is a fuzzy line on a map and anyone inside that fuzzy line can join so a, a, a city a community can join we have national forests national parks state parks tourism councils um businesses you know can belong to essentially this it's completely voluntary and by by having that voluntary sort of soft approach, people who would normally be really turned away from stuff like lighting ordinances, all of a sudden mm -hmm. get on board. Um, so like Helper, Utah, the little coal town uh, in Utah is a, is a big supporter of the Dark Sky Cooperative. Um, That's really so, cool. I hadn't yeah. heard of that before. That's really great. You're in it. It goes to flags. Are we in it? <laughs> okay, great. You know, I had another question for you. I'll go back and listen to the recording, but you had an amazing quote, something about beauty and fragility of a place. And uh, anyway, so do you mind if we use that and, and attribute it to you? Yeah, sure. Go for it. You might see it on a poster or something. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Chad. Did I notice that uh, you... Uh, did observing in Acadia National Park in Maine? Yes, uh, we first went out there in 2003. Um, <clears throat> took the newspaper reporter up to the top of Cadillac, showed them light pollution, talked to the, 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 the park, and uh, got them going on the um, their efforts there. And one of the interpreters who went to um, one of our trainings ended up moving out to Acadia and being very influential 
um, there. So again, instead of that Johnny Appleseed approach, you get one park who cares about night skies and people move around and, and, it, and it spreads. Do you have anything in New Jersey? <laughs> I do not believe we do. Um, at least not since I was employed by the National Park Service. Uh, there is a uh, an observatory in North, uh, <clears throat> Northwest New Jersey up there. So I don't know who I would contact uh, in your organization to put them in contact with you. But. Well, this is very inspirational, Chad. Thank you very much. It shows the impact that a dedicated person or small team can have in changing our perception and developing effective programs for doing something about it. So uh, anyway, this is one of the takeaway messages to seven. Were you raising your hand or is that just your pencil wiggling? I'm just keep taking notes. Okay. I, I'll, I'll uh, do one uh, extension of your talk, Chad. Please. Uh, we in the professional astronomical community have long been concerned about the increase in light pollution affecting major observatories. And most observatories, Kitt Peak and others, have occasionally gone out and the astronomer is motivated so he or she will spend a night or two nights actually taking some measurements, usually just zenith sky brightness measurements, and they're usually pretty dark and they say, oh, what a wonderful job for we have at this site. We've always wanted to be able to establish a continuous program of all sky measurements focusing on professional observatories. And uh, this was a dream, a dream, until there was a, an observatory down south of Tucson uh, for the um, Fred Whipple Observatory down there on Mount Hopkins. And they happened to be in a range of mountains for which a major copper mine was being proposed not too far away from it. And they're gonna operate 24 seven. And about a decade ago, the proposal was first being floated around and um, it was being evaluated and people said, well, wait a minute, you're gonna operate all night. What are you gonna do about the impact of your lighting on the dark skies of Whipple Observatory? Because after all, they're there before you were. And so the Forest Service basically, basically said a condition of your permit is that you set up a monitoring system to monitor the dark skies of Whipple Observatory every single observable night. And Chris, myself, were involved in that and we conscripted Dan Durisco and uh, a friend of his over there to basically develop a version of your system with a few improvements along the way, all being funded by this proposed copper mine. And so this all started and this was ready to go in uh, about 2000, 2019. We were all set, the equipment was being built. We were just waiting for an observatory. And this was gonna take data every single clear night. We're gonna be inundated with data, but we had a data pipeline all built, ready to go. And we're gonna be able to really measure what the increase in light pollution in Southern Arizona is going to be. Beautiful, beautiful. We were all set when COVID hit. The observatory shut down. The team is evaporated from that too. All of the equipment still exists. It's in Dan Dorisco's garage, I believe in California. We're just waiting for the Whipple Observatory to reopen. Now our fear is that Cambridge, which is the home of the observatory, is no longer particularly interested in this. So we may be able to offer maybe the National Park Service Night Sky Team a really good deal on some unused, pretty much state of the art, sky brightness measuring systems that they could take around and set up, not just for a single night, but perhaps set up for a week or a month. Whoever wants to do it too. Anyway, we're still reeling from how close we came for realizing a dream, but it 
hasn't happened yet. So yeah, just two question. years worth of data with that thing would have been amazing. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I do. I have uh, a comment, if I may. Please. Uh, Chad, that was fabulous. Um, I took some very brief notes, uh, but you hit on a number of uh, topics that really provide a history of, uh, I guess, what's happened in the last 30, 25 years uh, regarding an awareness, an increasing awareness and appreciation of dark skies. Uh, so I have a question, Chad. Uh, do you know if National Geographic on television or the Discovery Channel has done a program about uh, dark skies and a lot of what you've covered? I'm not aware of it. I, I know the Discovery Channel was engaged in some dark sky stuff um, from some of like their camps, uh, their, their education facilities, but not on television. But I, I don't watch a lot of TV, so I'm not, I, I, could, be, I could be incorrect. Well, I think, um, not to give a homework assignment, but I really wonder if <clears throat> your program that you've presented to us couldn't be put on a thumb drive and sent to uh, the appropriate uh, directors and producers at Discovery Channel. And uh, I, I think television could reach a, a great audience with your excellent program. And of course, you would be a, a, a perfect uh, person to interview and to have an interchange with. But of course, you know a number of other people and there are people here in Flagstaff who uh, uh, could, I think, put together uh, under the direction of National Geographic or uh, the Discovery Channel an excellent program. Uh, the people that are sitting here tonight uh, are quite aware of a lot of what you've talked about, but uh, uh, the general public uh, lives in an urban environment. I guess I'm lecturing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they would appreciate. They would really appreciate, I think, what you've shared tonight. Yeah, it's a good comment. I, th I think you're right in that the it's sort of, I think conditions are right for that kind of marquee, you know, documentary program like that. Well, you've done all of this homework, uh, as have a number of people on this panel tonight, uh, who, well, it's not a panel, in this meeting tonight, uh, who uh, you'd be a great contribution to uh, a growing awareness in our, in our country. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Well, I see we've actually managed to run over time. We thank you, Chad, once again, for a most interesting, enlightening, and informative talk about the history of this that has brought us to the point where we are now. And why don't we have you back maybe in some time in the future and you can give us the next 20 years in light pollution, dark sky, <laughs> your vision for it too. Anyway, I'd like to give you a round of applause on this too. And thank you very much, Chad. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chad. You're almost welcome.